Hello, and welcome to a special anniversary edition of Healthy Kingston, a health promotion and wellness program presented by the Kingston Board of Health. I'm your host, Janet Wade. We're celebrating 50 episodes over the past five years with an hour-long retrospective of some of the most informative and memorable moments. Healthy Kingston's focus is to offer timely, solid, and valuable health and safety information from regional health and safety experts. Topics can range from promoting healthy lifestyle practices to addressing substance abuse issues to recognizing and dealing with mental health concerns to the alleviation and treatment of illness and infectious diseases. So sit back and look at what we feel to be some of the more exciting exchanges well worth repeating. I'm excited, grateful, and appreciative to introduce the 50th program of Healthy Kingston. In the past five years, I've had the pleasure of meeting a number of interesting, dedicated, and knowledgeable people who serve our community, generally helping all of us and our families to be safe and healthy. Raising healthy kids is a priority for all parents and grandparents. Here are some tips for developing happy, healthy, successful students. And as a mom of three of four adult children and four grandchildren, yep. I realize how important it is, the big three, yep. as you had mentioned, sufficient sleep, a balanced diet, and plenty of physical activity. Mm -hmm. So those are three areas that I'd like to focus on for the next couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, as the Centers for Disease Control mentions, and uh, the National Pediatric Association, uh, Parents Magazine, you'll find it everywhere. The f um, children who get sufficient sleep, eat properly, and get sufficient ex exercise are better students in school. Mm -hmm. They uh, have less sick time at school. They're far more disciplined. Mm -hmm. So uh, wonderful areas, uh, wonderful reasons to focus on these three areas in raising your child mm -hmm. and realizing that in focusing on sleep, nutrition, and activity, you're not taking time away from your child's academic pursuits. Actually, you are adding to their academic success by doing these things. Right. Our town conservation agent and the executive director of the Jones River Watershed Association reflect on the impact of climate change on our air, water, temperature, insects, and fauna. Well, I think it's easy for anybody to say that the weather has changed, right? Everybody sees things are a little different than the way they remember them growing up. Um, and following the news, you're hearing all the time that a particular day of the month is setting an all-time record for heat, at least as far back as we've been recording the heat. Um, so you see that. Um, what they described as far as storms, I think we're already seeing too, that storms are more frequent, they're more intense. Um, so what we used to call as the 100-year storm, you're seeing that you know, a lot more frequently than that, mm -hmm. uh, which is leading to a lot of local issues. So I think you're right that we are starting to see this on the landscape here, and it's not just theory anymore. We have uh, Joan River Landing, the boatyard on the estuary there. Um, and we bought that in 2003, and since 2003, so 20 years ago, uh, the astronomical high tide has risen a foot. So what does that wow. mean to us is, you know, Matt says, it's, you know, sea level rise, sea level is rising. Generally, people don't get down to the coast unless it's a beautiful sunny day and want to go swimming, right? right? But we're there all the time, and when you have to deal many times a year with flooding inside the buildings and you can't keep it dry, and I'm talking about feet inside the buildings. You put things up on chair, you know, chairs up on tables, you have computers and, t and, and, and refrigerators jump into the water as it's going down. You learn a lot about water and you learn that sea level rise isn't theoretical. It's, it's extremely difficult to deal with. It is, although we, we're lucky because we're a mile and a half upstream of the bay, mm -hmm. but we're not dealing with crashing waves and, and, and monstrous, you know, uh, things like that. But the surge that comes in when we have a northeaster, mm -hmm. um, those are, they're predictable, but it's impossible to really stay dry and protect everything. 
We in Kingston are a coastal community, and we have to begin to address the reality of that. Not just keep flooring your cars through those flooded streets, mm -hmm. but actually s slow down driving the cars, buy more you know, um, environmentally safe cars in terms of our emissions, and, and um, think about, I mean, Matt, <laughs> Matt hit me today with, you want to you want a carpool over, but I was already in the vehicle, right? But we have to think about how we can reduce those emissions that we're responsible for. Mm -hmm. It's really important, I think, that we all take responsibility, we shoulder that responsibility for everything we do that's impacting the climate. I get that, and yeah, we will definitely address that further on in the program in more detail like that. That's great. Wow, uh, that is, that is a takeaway. That's a visual a, f a foot higher in the last 20 that's years. The, that's the, the calm high tide. Wow. That's the, the calm high tides. Mm -hmm. um, so you put a surge on top of that. So the, you got your nor'easters. Yeah. When the, that nor'easter is coming at 20 miles an hour or higher, I know we're getting two feet or three feet of surge on top of that wow. high tide. So that's the kind of thing that... You know, but for me, it's like I said, it's predictable. For somebody on the coast that's dealing with that velocity, not so much. That's why we're losing, you know, shoreline, and and we can't we can't save it. You know, we have to. We're not we're not accustomed to, you know, retreating. Retreating. Okay. So what what I would like to do now that we kind of have a sense of <laughs> the overview, the big problem is is dig deeper and in the individual impacts on our, our wildlife and the ecosystem around here. Uh, so first, um, the air quality, what would you say? Would be? Uh, the air quality has been horrible. I mean, you know, the, the, the Canadian fires and whatnot, it, very difficult for anybody with compromised respiratory issues. Very, very difficult. Very noticeable for me. I, I don't feel like I have a compromised respiratory, but I, you know, my sinuses were, I couldn't get enough oxygen. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. like it. It affected me. And, you know, it's, it's not, it, it's happened here before. I mean, we really have to understand that although it's been a wet August, <laughs> It was a very hot July, right. and you know we do have some beautiful trees and, and open spaces that could catch fire pretty easily, and those are very hard to contain once you have that amount of you know you have the pests that that Matt was talking about, and and, and dead uh, vegetation that you know that's harder to contain than just a brush fire in your backyard. Right. How about you, Matt? Yeah. yeah, I mean, for years now we've dealt with air quality issues from Western and Canadian wildfires. Um, and whether everybody really feels it in their lungs or not, I mean, it is affecting everybody, especially young people, older people, anybody that's compromised. But, um, you know, the cause of all of that is driven by climate change, it's driven by invasive plants, it's driven by invasive insects or insects that are range expanding. And it's not really going away. It seems to just keep getting worse. At some point you figure, well, everything must burn out and then we can reset. But with the invasive plants filling the gaps every year and then drying out, it's just not the case. So that we're going to be dealing with. It highlights the importance of our local community, our local ecosystem, and making sure we have abundant trees, abundant green spaces. That's why we do a lot of what we do. It's not just about making a place for animals to live, although that's true. We should have healthy ecosystems around us. I mean, we breathe because of all of the plants that are around us, you know. Can you explain you know, that for sure. those yeah, of I mean, us who are you know, your minded Average plant is, you know, taking the sun's energy and taking carbon dioxide out of the air, and one of its, you know, products that it puts out into the air as a result of that is oxygen. So you know, you have more oxygen in the air around you when you live near abundant vegetation and particularly trees. Um, not only that, but you have, you know, shading effects and cooling effects that you get from having a tree canopy. They call them heat island effects. When you have an area where it's more like a city, you have less tree cover, you have more blacktop, you have more radiant heat. You know, mm -hmm. and it's just, it just makes so much more sense to make sure we, that we're surrounded by trees. They're not just something that, you know, puts out an annoyance like leaves to clean up or acorns to clean up off your lawn. I mean, they're, they're crucial, not just for wildlife, but for us and our comfort. Right. 
And you know, from a, being that I have a, a health background, um, I've noticed a lot more people uh, having asthma attacks, a lot of difficulty breathing with yeah. the um, with the humidity and the the damp air, and um, as you said, the lack of oxygen. Yeah, definitely been an issue. Um, well, you alluded to this uh, a bit, Pine. Uh, the water, the local water system. So our ponds, our rivers, um, the ocean. The impact. On, let's start with that, and then the its habitat. Um, you know, the fish that are located in it. Matt, do you want to start with that, and we'll get into pine. Sure. We know pine will have a lot. Yeah, to she'll say. have plenty to say on this. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I would say, in general, it's it's been bad. I mean, we've been modifying these aquatic systems for 400 years in the Northeast and especially in Kingston. And particularly since the start of the Industrial Revolution, we've been heavily modifying them with concrete and completely blocking flow. And you know, all of our stormwater systems for our entire roadway were basically made so that they just dumped all the stormwater off into wetlands or into the rivers and streams that run directly out into the ocean. Um, so all of that contamination, uh, lack of oxygen, um, it's lawns. I mean, suburbanization, our, the number of acres of lawn that you have now where everybody uses fertilizer, all that fertilizer, or a lot of it, runs off into the stormwater system. We have to live more deliberately, right? We shouldn't, we shouldn't be running our, our you know, gas-fired engines you know, to run to the store three times a day or whatever, or even three times a week. We have to plan better. We need to plan our route so that we get more done because it's such a huge cost. You think gas is expensive? Hmm. You ain't seen nothing yet yeah. when it comes to trying to deal with the sea level rise stuff. You haven't seen anything yet. It's going to be through the center of town before you know it. And, and I'm not, you know, I mean, they're discovering things all the time. So. You know, people don't, people think, oh yeah, well that's down in the islands and all that stuff. No, sea level is rising faster where we are than almost anywhere in the world. And it has to do with the ocean currents, it has to do with the Gulf Stream, it has to do with all that hot water you were talking about coming up from Florida, mm -hmm. it has to do with the oscillating current, and, and it has to do with the melting glaciers. And if those glaciers do melt and the current stops moving, we are running for our lives, and nothing you ever thought was important to you will be important to you. Mental illness is our number one local, regional, state, and national health concern. The Director of Social Services at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Plymouth offers signs and symptoms of potential mental health problems along with local treatment resources. What should we all be looking for um, in our loved ones, people we work with, people we socialize with that we know um, that might be red flags that maybe this person needs help or is seeking help, wants yeah. help? So that's a really great question. Um, there are behavioral and cognitive changes that can be indications um, to watch out for um, in people around us and people we love. Um, people we work with, people in the community. So some of those behavioral changes to watch for is changes in sleep, either change, uh, sleeping too much, difficulty getting out of bed, um, sleeping too little, insomnia, I think is a very, very concerning um, health crisis that leads to very concerning mental health crisis. Um, constant feelings of um, fatigue that might be unexplainable. They, so they've had medical testing and they just can't find the cause of what's causing this fatigue. Um, you know, longer bouts of uh, deep sadness. Um, we also see irritability or changes in mood um, as being signs to watch out for. Uh, withdrawing from social activities, so isolating again, is a, something that we need to be very careful and watch for. Um, in other types of mental health or mental illnesses or diseases, there's an onset of paranoid, paranoia, or increased anxiety. Um, and I think, you know, we already talked a little bit about the intense mood changes. And those two things to watch for are people talking about um, wanting to die or, you know, just talking about suicide, 
been talking about feelings of feeling empty, hopeless, or not having reason to live. We talk about great guilt or shame, um, feeling trapped as if there's no other solutions, um, unbearable pain, emotional or physical pain, um, talking about being a burden to others. The other things we need to watch for is use of alcohol or substances to self-medicate. Um, and we again, talking about withdrawing from family and friends are all really important things for us to really keep an eye out for. Um, to be compassionate and set up whenever possible, a private, um, compassionate place to have a discussion with them and let them know what your concerns are and what you're observing. I think it's sometimes really helpful to be concrete if you're seeing specific things or behavior changes. They might feel less attacked. Um, they might feel more supported. If I, you know, I notice that, you know, you're having a hard time getting into work on time. You having a, are you having a hard time getting out of bed? Um, you know, asking questions like that, normalizing um, the symptoms that you're seeing, the behaviors that you're seeing is often sometimes indication of somebody having a really difficult time and we, and we care about you. You know, go to urgent care. There's mental health urgent cares now, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Or call your primary care. You know, medically, if you are having chest pains, you go to the emergency room. Like, we need to be thinking about the signs and symptoms of mental health and substance use disorders in the same way that we are medical. So in that case, if you're having thoughts of harming yourself, harming somebody else, severely depressed, unable to function, get to the emergency room. Um, so those are, you know, we need to think about it and I think in very similar ways. The 988 Lifeline and the Community Behavior Health Centers. So kind of breaking that down a little bit. Um, if you're connected with a primary care office, many primary care offices and, and health centers absolutely recognize that your mental health is part of your overall physical health and well-being. And many have either embedded behavioral health specialists, so therapists, um, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners into their practices or have a um, a referral source, a relationship with practices that can re they can refer you to. So they're a really, really great resource to go to. They're also really busy, um, you know, with COVID and the flu season and everything else. So I want to make sure that you have more additional resources um, to go to as well. So the 988 Lifeline um, was launched in July of last year. I know Leanne has posted that to your um, the Kingston website and on social media a number of times, um, but that's an incredibly important um, resource. So 988 offers 24 seven access to trained crisis clinicians who can help people experiencing mental health related distress. So this could be thoughts of suicide, it could be mental health or a substance use crisis or other kinds of emotional distress. So what's the really nice piece about this is I think it's truly really designed to have options for all ages. Um, so people can call, people can text 988, or they can go to the website and do a chat. Um, and the chat is 988lifeline.org. And they can call either for themselves or they can call for somebody that they might be concerned about and get some guidance and direction. So that's an incredibly important um, kind of universal entry point that no matter where you live in the United States, you can reach out 24 hours a day and be connected with a trained crisis counselor that can help. So the other incredibly important resource that launched January 3rd, so earlier this month across the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts, are um, community behavior health centers. And the best way for me to describe them as they're urgent care for behavior health. So they're urgent care centers for mental health and substance use crises. And so there's 25 across the, the Commonwealth. We, our local one here in, in the Plymouth Kingston area is at 41 Industrial Park um, Road in Plymouth. And so what the community behavioral health centers, or they're called CBHCs, provide, um, both in person and via telehealth, are same day evaluations and access to treatment with timely follow-up appointments, again, mental health and substance use. They have evening and weekend hours, 
So, and they have, um, they offer evidence-based treatment for the whole spectrum and range of um, behavioral health. There's also a 24 hour hotline um, available for folks to call as well. So down here in Plymouth um, at the urgent care center, the community-based, the community behavioral health center, um, they're open Monday through Friday for walk-ins, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and Saturdays and Sundays, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. They see all ages. Wow. Um, so they can also call and make an appointment, but again, walk-ins are a really important aspect of the care that they're providing. And so the phone number, so this is a partnership locally here in Plymouth between um, High Point Treatment Center um, and Child and Family Services. And the phone number for Child and Family Services, again, is 24 hours a day, is 508-996-3120. So this is an alternative, just like urgent care for medical reasons is an alternative to the emergency room. This is an alternative um, for behavioral health, mental health and substance abuse um, from the emergency room. Substance abuse is plaguing our young people in the forms of vaping, alcohol, marijuana and opioids. The following are segments done on the increasing incidence of vaping among young people and what we need to know followed by portions of an interview with a former Kingston High School student and his mother, relaying lessons learned from his journey through marijuana addiction. And today we're going to be talking about marijuana and its impact on adolescents, particularly physically and emotionally. When marijuana is smoked or vaporized, it passes from the lungs into the bloodstream, which carries it to organs throughout the body, including the brain. Its effects begin almost immediately, and they can last for one to three hours. This can affect decision-making, concentration, and memory for days after use, especially in people who use marijuana regularly. If marijuana is consumed in foods or beverages, it may last for many hours. There are several short-term effects to using marijuana, including altered states such as seeing brighter colors, as well as an altered sense of time changes in mood, slow reaction time, problems with balance and coordination, and increased appetite, trouble thinking and problem solving, memory problems, and even hallucinations, delusions, or possibly psychosis. Mixing marijuana with alcohol can cause increased heart rate and blood pressure, and can also cause further slowing of the ability to think, problem solve, and react. There are some various very serious long-term effects to using marijuana, including an increased heart rate. When someone uses marijuana, this increases the risk of a heart attack. There are also respiratory issues. Smoke from marijuana irritates the lungs and it can cause a chronic cough, something similar to how people are affected when they're regularly using cigarettes. There's an increased risk for mental health problems. Marijuana use has been linked with depression and anxiety as well as suicidal thoughts among teens. In addition, research suggests that smoking marijuana during the teen years might increase the risk for developing psychosis in people with a genetic risk for developing schizophrenia. Another risk is reduced school performance. Students who smoke marijuana tend to get lower grades and are more likely to drop out of high school than their peers who do not use. And the effects of marijuana on attention, memory, and learning can last for days or weeks. It's also been shown that teens who use marijuana have a reduced life satisfaction. Research suggests that people who use marijuana regularly for a long time are less satisfied with their lives and have more problems with their friends and family compared to those who do not use marijuana. We're also looking at impaired driving. Marijuana affects a number of skills required for safe driving, including alertness, concentration, coordination, and reaction time. So it's not safe to drive high or to ride with someone using marijuana. Marijuana makes it hard to judge distances and react to signals and sounds on the road. And high school seniors who smoke marijuana are twice as more likely to receive a traffic ticket, and 65% are more likely to get into an accident than other teens. Again, to young people and to parents particularly, because parents will be watching this. Um, it's important for them to keep in mind. Just, um, I mean, we've all, 
um, you know, I've, I've said it, but basically just the main points of just, you know, keep their kid from boredom because that's the worst thing that you can do. Um, you know, even though you play sports, I know it's, mm -hmm. I mean, geez. it's hard. They're going to get bored at some point, yeah. but just try and keep it as minimum as possible. Um, you know, there's obviously the whole like depression aspect and the isolation. Um, you know, I think those are like the biggest ones that you can see. Um, you can see how they're, you know, uh, decreasing in happiness and, um, see them like spending more time in the room on their phone, which is normal to an extent. Um, when you see it go over, um, you should definitely start noticing that. Um, and then it all comes down to your gut feeling. Um, cause you can, I mean, obviously she could kind of tell that stuff wasn't really going right, um, mm -hmm. with who I was hanging out with, you know, what I was saying I was doing, but I really wasn't, um, just kind of the big things of deception, depression, um, and definitely boredom, I think is like just the key things to be able to keep in mind to realize, you know, something could be happening. Um, even if it's just depression, you know, like, you know, still get that going. Cause they, like my mom said, could start self-medicating cause it's exactly what I did. Um, and so definitely just keep an eye on those things. And, uh, for teens, if their parents ever show them this, it's, more just um, realize that you have potential no matter who you are, where your circumstances from, you know, who you hang out with, like you have a potential and the only way to reach that is with a clear mind and a full heart that, you know, not, that's not affected by all these different drugs and chemicals. Um, Cause from then on, you know, you'll get the good grades, you'll keep everybody happy, everybody will love you. And, um, and that's not to say that nobody, um, that everybody doesn't already love you, but, um, I didn't for a while. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's easier to love you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, just keep those, um, in mind that you have a potential and the only way that's to reach good. that is just with a clear mind. Um, cause you're not going to get anywhere without it. So and wonderfully said, can I just, just interact, interject and say that, you know, they say, look for the signs, right? Well, we had raised him and all the other kids we had. Um, with morals and ethics and all of that. And, and when we noticed the things he was doing, lying, cheating, stealing, he talked about the money. I had, I'd never brought my purse inside after I realized. And so you're like, who is this? Yes. My, what happened? And uh, so, but you can go full circle and you can be, have a big heart and be strong and brave and be able to tell your story and be the leader of sobriety in your community. And that's what I think you are, Cam. Proud yeah. of you. Absolutely. Both of you are. And uh, I can't commend you more and certainly appreciate the fact that you're willing to share your stories with the people in our town and to their mm -hmm. credit. So people, listen up <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, talk to your kids, talk to your teenagers. Um, I raised for myself. It was, as I told them, um, I'm your parent. I'm not your friend. Mm -hmm. and, That's um, right. That's you right. got to you got to be brave you know, and take up. action. Exactly. Yeah, be, brave. be brave and take action. This is a, a great way to start. Social concerns are increasing the development of advocacy groups. The following excerpts are from an interview with the South Shores Director of Mothers Demand Action Against Gun Violence and a detective in the Kingston Police Department. It was founded, as you said, in 2012 by a, by a mother of five, um, after, right after the Sandy Hook tragedy. And today, it is part of a large national network called Every Town for Gun Safety. And we number over 5 million supporters and mm -hmm. active volunteers. I do want to stress that we are not anti-gun. We are anti-gun violence. We respect the Second Amendment, but we believe that we can respect it and still demand common sense, evidence-based laws and policies that have been proven to save lives by keeping guns out of the hands of dangerous people. How extensive a program is this in Massachusetts? Well, we have a very active state chapter in Massachusetts and know that there are state chapters in all 50 states. Our state chapter consists of eight active local groups and I lead one of those local groups. It's called Moms Demand Action South Shore. Mm -hmm. And we cover about 34 cities and towns in southeastern Massachusetts. What does your organization actually do on the ground? We do many things. One is we work on legislative advocacy. We also have public education campaigns, such as the Be Smart campaign that we're going to talk about today. We honor and support gun violence survivors. 
those would be three of the main things that we do. Moms Demand Action uh, launched the Be Smart program in 2015. I want to ask you and your audience, did you know that in the US, we have the largest reported rate of child unintentional death, gun death and injury in the world? And did you also know that every year 1,500 American children ages 17 and under have their lives cut short by gun violence, of which 100 of those roughly are unintentional shootings and 600 are teen gun suicides? Remember, five simple but responsible behaviors. And I know we're going to go through each one, but yes. what are the... what? What do the S-M-A-R-T, what does it stand for? S is secure your guns in your homes and vehicles. M mm -hmm. is model responsible behavior. A is ask about storage of guns in other people's homes. R is recognize the role of guns in suicide. And T is to tell your peers, spread the word. Any type of firearm, if you're going to own a firearm, you have to be properly licensed. There's LTCs and FIDs. LTC is a license to carry, uh, which typically is your sidearm type, uh, you know, firearms, your pistols, uh, revolvers. Uh, it also allows you to own rifles and shotguns. FID basically is essentially rifles and shotguns, more or less used for hunting. Uh, but for in the home and in the vehicle, the storage requirements are the same, regardless of if you have an FID or an LTC, uh, their storage requirements are the same. So you need to have one of those to, to possess the gun to begin with, right? And then in the home, if you're, uh, whether there's other people that live in your home or not, it needs to be properly secured. So whether it's with a trigger lock system, locking the access to the trigger, whether it's in a safe, uh, in a locked cabinet, the weapon needs to be secured in your home if it's not currently on your person in what we call your direct control. So if you're not currently using the weapon in some way, holding it, you know, having it on your side, if it's not currently in your direct control, it needs to be properly secured. In uh, the vehicle, it needs to be both secured and unloaded. Uh, there's that slight discrepancy it's between in the home and in the, in the vehicle. In the home, there's the argument relative to self-defense. Some people would like the ability to have a firearm loaded. But if you do have one loaded and it's not in your direct control, it still needs to be secured from access, not just from children, but from other adults, unlicensed adults, anyone. Uh, if, for one reason or another, uh, a child gets access to your, let's say you're a licensed firearm holder, a child gets access to your firearm, uh, that in and of itself, the child having access to the gun is evidence on its face that you violated this, the storage laws. Uh, so you could be charged criminally. If a child gets access to it, it's a felony. If an unlicensed adult gets access to it, it's a misdemeanor. Either way, you could face jail time uh, and more likely not face losing your license to carry and losing your firearms. Over 75% of unintentional child fatal shootings occurred in the victim's home or in their car. Over 80% of child suicides by guns, those children procured those guns from their own home. Really? And finally, everyone is so uh, worried about school shootings. Uh, about 78% of active shooters get their guns in school shootings, get their guns from their home or from the home of a relative or a friend. So if we all as a community worked hard to secure the weapons that we, we could have. limit that we have right. in the homes, we could really help put a dent into these horrifying statistics. This final segment is on offering the gift of life by being an organ donor. Excerpts are from an interview with a woman who donated a kidney to her husband experiencing renal failure. So Maria, thank you very much about being here to talk to us about your account of being a living kidney donor and what the, that has entailed for you and for your family. So I'd like to start out with, how does one become an organ donor? Well, the first thing that you want to consider is the question of why you want to be an organ donor. In my case, I was exposed to organ donation through my husband, who was diagnosed in 2011 with chronic kidney disease. It's a terminal illness that requires eventually to have dialysis and can be life-threatening. And as a result of that, I started looking into what the whole living donor uh, process is. As I became more in tune with what that entailed, I said, why not give it a shot? The odds were good that 
it would save his life and certainly improve mine. So. Tremendi tremendously courageous. What exactly is the selection process? Can you tell us a little bit about that in being a donor? Well, as far as the selection process, um, once you've made that decision, you'll basically be going through a number of different diagnostic tests to make sure that you're well enough, healthy enough to donate. Um, they don't want to put you at risk for mm -hmm. something that they can find during that time. Sure. Um, so sure enough, you'll go through diagnostic testing. It'll probably take several months before you can get cleared as a donor. Really? Several months? Several months. Wow. Yeah. So this is something you have to anticipate. Anticipate, right? Yeah. It's not anything um, that's short term. In fact, when we had our surgeries, it was two years after um, he had been diagnosed. Wow. Okay. I, I did not realize that. And not so much because of the diagnostic testing. I had been cleared early on, but um, we had to wait till his illness progressed to end-stage renal disease where he would have been going on dialysis if the donation had not come through. Oh, okay. Um, what did you have to consider as a donor in um, making the decision? Well, as I started to mention, the, the most important thing is to really do a little soul searching and think about, um, you know, can you give it away unconditionally and not have any strings attached, okay? The other thing is you need to be able to understand that in, there is no guarantee that it's going to work. Right. There is absolutely no guarantee that it's going to work, even under the best conditions and when the donor and the recipient are well matched. Um, so can you live with that if the donated organ is rejected? Right. Plus, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned, which shocked me, I mean, sometimes the donor will be the one um, who will pass during the experience, and the recipient lives. Exactly, right. Yeah, it really is soul searching and in some ways even facing, you know, your own existential mortality. mortality. Right. Yeah. Um, are you prepared? Uh, are you prepared physically and emotionally? Um, do you have support in going through this process? Yeah, once um, you've decided to be tested as a candidate, then you'll be assigned a living donor advocate through the transplant center. Okay. And basically what their sole role is, is to be your advocate, to help you through the process and to basically um, listen to your concerns and address those concerns. So you're not really going through it alone. Okay. Um, however, you do want to make sure that you do have a good support system that'll help you. Oh, absolutely. Because even though from a physical standpoint, most donors are in good physical shape and chances are that um, they'll continue to be that way. Um, it's really the emotional and the psychological um, act of giving a part of yourself, even when it's for a great cause, sure. um, that can be a very impactful. Absolutely. Um, can you tell us then a little bit about the surgery and the recuperative process that you go through after you've had it? Well, there are basically two types of surgery to have um, a kidney donation. It could either be done laparoscopically, which entails a few small incisions in your abdomen. Here I am showing you. Here it is. <laughs> um, a few small incisions in your abdomen or the old-fashioned way, as um, sometimes it's called, the iconic flank incision, which is you know quite extensive. And depending on the type of surgery that you have, then certainly, understandably, the longer it may take to recuperate. Right. Um, I was in the hospital. I had the laparoscopic procedure. And I was in the hospital for about three days total. Um, and the average is about two days uh, for most donors. These are a small sample of the topics and information discussed over the past five years. We hope you found this valuable. If you've been a regular viewer, thank you for your support. 
It keeps us motivated to continue to provide informed health programming. To those of you who just tuned in, we hope you continue to give Healthy Kingston a try. There are endless topics to discuss, and if you're interested in viewing past programs in their entirety, refer to the Kingston Board of Health website for the topics and the links, or to the PAC-TV, the local scene, community relations section, or to Healthy Kingston under YouTube. Thank you for joining us, and as always, stay safe and healthy.